Hi, this is Lace Posen. It's the end of December 2019. The new year is about to begin 2020. Welcome to this uh, episode of uh, my Fearful Flying Plus Anxiety series that I've been conducting the last uh, little while. And in this particular episode, I'm going to follow through on an episode I did uh, not long ago, the previous one, uh, where I set up this scenario comparing two modes of food preparation and comparing them to anxiety management. One was the Iron Chef and one was a short order cook who works in a diner. The approach I like to take with my patients is the Iron Chef approach, a deep dive into understanding how anxiety works, how in the brain it's facilitated. Some Name some of the parts of the brain that are responsible for threat management, for anxiety management, for balance, for how we think about things and how we feel about things. And doing a really deep dive into that over a number of sessions, or in this case, a number of, of videos. In contrast, you have the short order cook approach. And this is where someone works in a diner, there's a menu you've got to follow. There's very little deviation around that menu. If a food item is not available, that item is off the menu. There is no substitutions. You've got to be quick and you've got to be accurate. And these two places, these two food preparation styles have a place in, in the culinary arts. Sometimes if someone comes to see me and they're flying in three or four days and we really don't have the time to both do a deep dive and do a flight with me into a location by commercial jet to put into practice all that they've learned in the sessions, then it will be a menu driven thing. Do this, do this, do this, do this. We're not going to get into an iron chef kind of approach. Most people who will work with fearful flyers will take the short order cook approach. That's the way it works sometimes. And just to give you an example, um, not too long ago, in 2019, uh, NBC had a, um, a report on fearful flying after there were a number of in-flight incidents involving turbulence. And uh, the producers took one of their staff members to Los Angeles and uh, where there's a simulator, uh, a full body length simulator. They actually make films in there. Uh, for TV and for movies, and they actually use this as a as a place to make films. It's got one side is open, so you can actually make films in there. But the thing's on is on the absorber, shock absorbers, and they actually can move around. And it's quite a good thing for simulating turbulence. And in fact, some um, courses can be run there in fear of flying. And what I want to introduce you to before we talk about the techniques of being an iron chef is some of the short order cook stuff which frankly I don't recommend as a long-term solution. It's there for quick and dirty, just for this flight coming up, and that's it. Do not expect in the long run to get much better at this. It's just Band-Aid stuff, but it has its place in Fear for Flying. They used NBC, a well-known pilot who's written uh, about uh, Fear for Flying and participating in a number of self-help groups as a colleague and as an advisor and so forth. And uh, unfortunately, he gets into a little bit of strife as uh, if you were going to find the original, talking a little bit of uh, what I call in the trade psychobabble um, about how the brain works. And it's really not particularly accurate, but it has a lot of superficial validity. So some of the things he recommends for the young person who's involved in this um, is, as a, for instance, this one, uh, where it's uh, this young woman has a difficulty during the takeoff run. It's very noisy. There's lots of vibrations. And so he advises uh, breathe through a straw during the takeoff run. Um, and that will kind of somehow um, change your breathing patterns. Okay. It's not too dissimilar to people who were advised um, some time back to breathe through a, a, a paper bag to keep their carbon dioxide and oxygen levels uh, okay. We do know that lots of panicky situations arise because of disturbances in breathing. So you'll find that most fearful flying and anxiety treatments will advocate an improved use of breathing, but most of them get it for the wrong right reasons. And most people say use breathing to calm down and that's not the reason to do it. 
that will we'll explore in another session. Um, so breathing through a straw, as it turns out, the, the idea is you know, breathe through a straw during the takeoff run, and that way you'll you'll um, get your breathing under control. The other suggestion that comes out is in the midst of turbulence, um, use your left hand. If your right hand is one you, you write with, use your left hand to write your name or write things down. Um, so it can sort of confuses your brain and uses the other half. This is the explanation that's given and and sort of these things are all distractions. They're all distractions. In the trade, I call them safety behaviors. They're there to help you momentarily take your attention away from your discomfort. As it turns out, in the work that we do, following an evidence base of what actually works. We do use breathing through a straw from time to time, but it's not to reduce anxiety, it's to increase it, to actually experience shortness of breath and the discomfort that it brings in the therapy room so that people can get used to this and understand it's uncomfortable, I don't like it, I'm probably having reduced breath intake involuntarily when I don't even know about the fact that I'm doing this. So we actually bring on this shortness of breath to let people see it's uncomfortable, but you can cope with this. You're probably doing this without realizing you're doing it. The other one, running with the left hand, all of these things, these distractions and safety behaviors all rely on external objects. They all rely on having a pen handy and it's got ink, having paper available to you, having the straws available to you, in some cases having headphones available to you, all to try and reduce your appreciation of the discomfort you're experiencing in the work that we do we want to try and increase the tolerance for discomfort and the only way you do that is to practice the uncomfortable what practice i'm trying to avoid that your very avoidance and getting really good at avoiding discomfort is only perpetuating your fear it's keeping it going because it's giving you the lessons that says i can't stand discomfort I will do whatever it takes to avoid this. This is what stops people going to dentists and then running up huge bills because what they could have done more quickly, they've now waited a long time, there's extra work needs to be done, not paying your fine on time, I'll let it go, I can't be bothered now. One of the biggest skills you can develop in anxiety management is learning how to better tolerate your discomfort. And this is the Iron Chef approach. So we build in to an Iron Chef approach lots of exposure, not so much to the outside world triggers, but to the internal triggers that, that tell you that you're in a wet world, as it's called, that tells you, uh oh, my usual way of handling things has gone a little bit off out of range. We have lots of senses inside us which inform our brains that things are going outside of range and so we can start to experience ourselves getting all sweaty we can't focus properly all sorts of things your task if you're going to be an iron chef is to think about what are the triggers for me to experience these discomforts this loss of composure as i call it that tends to take my my senses somewhat away from a nice central zone think of an air conditioning system that you've set to 24 Fahrenheit 24 centigrade or whatever it is in Fahrenheit 75 it never sits exactly there. it drifts up slides back down drifts back up and so it hovers around your set mark it never sits exactly there because it's got sensors built in that keep moving up and down well that's how our bodies work as well so your task is to identify throughout the flight envelope, which could start weeks before when you make the booking or when your boss says, Phil, I'd like you to go to place XYZ to deliver a presentation. We've got some new clients there. And you go into this mode. And your task is to identify all those locations in this flight envelope, which includes getting off the plane at the end, which is triggering this loss of composure. And we have to find out What's the best way to manage each of those components? The things I want you to pay attention to when you contemplate doing this is firstly, what are the sensations? I'm what's my inner wet world telling me? The most important things, what's my heart rate doing? 
what's my skin conductance or my sweatiness doing. Forget about feelings. That will come later. How am I behaving? Am I gripping seats? Am I tightening belts? Am I grabbing the person next to me? Am I trying to fill in an iPad with a coloring book or whatever it might be to try and distract myself? Look for your distractions. Look for your safety behaviors. These are things that come naturally and reflexively. But just because they're natural, you don't have to think about them, and they're reflexive, same thing, doesn't mean it's the best thing to do. In fact, most times, you're going to want to inhibit those naturally, ordinarily occurring reflexes because evolution designed them for other purposes. Falling over cliffs, falling out of trees, tripping over and pushing your hands forward, closing your eyes or hiding your eyes or covering your ears from loud noises. Very old evolutionary significant things. Maybe even getting close to something that looks like it might be a snake in front of you when in fact it might turn out to be a branch. All of which triggers these <gasps> automatic reactions in planes and in many other places, elevators, whatever else it might be. These, those old, old hardwired fears can be, or threats, can be easily triggered. And our task is to identify them and find an alternative means not to try and get rid of the automatic stuff straight away. But you've got to learn to do new things. One of the things first things you've got to learn to do is put yourself in that experience. If you want to do it in small steps, fine. You want to do it in big steps, just as good. I like to randomize it with my patients so they never know which is, is it's going to be. It's going to be a hard one or an easy one, whatever it might be. You randomize because that's what life's about. It's random. Okay. And then we want to try and approach these things and experience some discomfort. Put a name, a name to it. That's really uncomfortable. I don't like it. That's about an 8 out of 10 compared to my worst ever sensations. Look for your behaviors. What do you do automatically? And ask, is this useful or is it just automatic? Just because it's automatic, let me reinforce this, doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. We've sometimes got to learn new things. Uh, for instance, that I sometimes use with my patients. It might be that you're in your mid-40s. You've been driving a rather underpowered car. Uh, most of your life, you know how to steer and brake, it's okay. Suddenly you come in for a bit of a windfall and you go and buy yourself a really powerful Porsche 930, 600 horsepower compared to 125 horsepower. You better get some lessons on how to drive that car properly because on a wet road, a rainy road, a slippery road, all that power and you're still driving it like your 125 horsepower Kia or Hyundai, it's going to bring you grief. You've got to actually learn to change your driving behaviors to suit that car, just like pilots who move from light planes into twin props and into jets have to make a lot of changes to the way they fly. This is new knowledge that they must acquire and give up the old knowledge. Well, the new, this is the iron ship approach. Give up old knowledge and acquire new knowledge constantly, learning how to do things. So the things we want to focus on is what are the sensations that I experience and are they normal? Or am I somehow exaggerating by holding onto things tight or inadvertently holding my breath? What are the thoughts I'm having? So if you're walking down the jetway, rather than saying, oh my God, here we go. I'm walking down this tunnel and I'm going to be trapped inside this plane for eight hours. No. Change your language. Identify the language that produces the <gasps> sensations quite automatically. Use words like trapped and tunnel. You're going to trigger your inner meerkat into go into threat mode. Not helpful. Okay? So, you're not walking down a tunnel to be trapped. You're walking down to use the language of aviation, the aero bridge, or the jetway. You're going to enter the plane where you're going to be cocooned for the next several hours, basically subleasing a little Airbnb space for yourself. That's your little space for the next eight hours. Do what you like with it, basically, within reason. Okay, don't give up your seat if you like it. Put whatever you might need during the flight under your seat, anything you might not need during the flight, but you want to have with you as a spare, like clothes in the overhead, so you can always get access to it and know the right thing to do. Now, I'm going to expand on this a little bit more, but I want to make sure you understand this difference. Be careful of using short order cook methods to distract yourself, which require equipment which can fail you. You need to know no matter what happens, I can manage myself 
by myself, even if my iPad and iPhone failed me, I ran out of batteries, my headphones no longer work, I left something at home, you need to know you can do this on your own and be in a management state of mind when it comes to this, not a distraction, let me get this over with, I can't stand the discomfort thing. And so the thing we want to practice as much as possible is how to be with that discomfort. And the longer you stay with that and practice and get better at it, guess what? It doesn't make itself known to you as quickly or to as many things that might trigger it, nor is it going to sustain itself for as long. And you'll have a better way to go into recovery in between your ups and downs on board a flight. In my next video, I'm going to pay some attention to this notion of recovery, which has been ignored for a long time, but which is probably one of the most important things to learn to do. So I hope this has been useful, this business of being able to separate out Master Chef or Iron Chef, to be accurate, from Short Order Cook. They both have their place, but in the long run, if in 2020 you really want to deal with your anxiety once and for all, you do not want to take the Short Order Cook approach, you want to take a somewhat deeper dive into understanding how it's feeling, what you're doing, how you're sensing, and what you're thinking. Uh, and this is where the rest of the series I'm going to be working on. Uh, hopefully I'll get one up uh, early in the new year and we'll do some more work on that. Now, if you want to subscribe so you can keep up to date with uh, the things that I'm doing. At the same time, if there are some personal things that you'd like to see me include in a future video, and a lot of the stuff that I put in here comes from my patient work during the week, and I think, oh, that would make a good video to make. I'll do that. So write to me either privately. Um, you can find my email. I'm around. I won't put it up on, video, on YouTube. Um, or you can just put it in the comments below. I tend to respond fairly swiftly if I can to the comments. And, um, and I'll try and make something of, of your comments to me. And a response maybe will make a, a YouTube video of it. All right. I wish you all the best for, 2000 and, uh, for 2020. And I'll be back in the uh, maybe before or otherwise in the, in the new year with more information on how to deal and become a better self-manager of your anxiety, in particular your fear of flight. Bye for now.